Three deeper cuts. Hoo-ha! I will put myself on the line every day. I will not surrender. I will not turn against myself during tough times. I will come totally prepared to compete every day. I will not show weakness on the outside. The crazier it gets, the more I will love it. I love competing more than winning. Welcome to 3 Deeper Cuts, your lifestyle magazine for the practicing surgical pathologist. I'm your host, Chuck G. Every week we bring you something to think about, something to read, or something to listen to. 3 Deeper Cuts is brought to you by Formalin Fixed Paraffin Embedded Tissue. Emphasis on the formalin, because out. Without the high exposure of 10% buffered neutral formalin that I experienced during my four years of residency in St. Louis, I wouldn't be able to think about half of the crazy things that I write about here at Three Deeper Cuts Publishing. And if you're not a pathologist and you're listening to this right now, thank you and welcome. Okie dokie, ladies and gentlemen. It's, uh, It's good to be here with you once again. Seven days since our last little chit-chat. What do I got for you this week? Some announcements. Uh, The Shins. Check out the 2007 album by The Shins. Uh, Just give The Dark Side a try. There's some good tracks on that album. Uh, One of them is called Sea Legs. I don't know if that... uh, You know, I probably got drunk and listened to that and then just randomly commissioned in the Navy, like submitted my paperwork. I'm pretty sure that's what happened. And then that dictated the trajectory of the next 15 years of my life. Uh, Yeah, there's some good songs in that. I don't know. Somebody gave me that album when I was uh, first or second year med student. And I don't know. That was my anthem for that year. Uh, Back to the present. What else do we got? Uh... Got another desk, so I was having some issues with the desk in the office. Uh, Do you really care about that? Yeah, of course you do. You're listening. Um, Yeah, I can't recommend this enough. The Uplift Desk. It's a company based out of Austin. Uh, I'm not sponsored yet, uh, but uh, I would recommend it, uh, even for small desks. And hear me out. The reason that I bought it, uh, I already had one that that I used just for work. And I do some, like a significant amount of drafts of just material, stories, essays, whatever, even podcasts, intros. I'll do that on a typewriter because I think that's the best way to escape the modern pull of electronic devices, which are good, but also damaging to your neurochemistry. Uh, So this was the, this is the first relatively inexpensive desk on the market that's adjustable in height and also is sturdy enough to hold a vintage typewriter. And by vintage typewriter, I, I have a small one. It's, it's not, I mean, it's about 15 inches. No, 13, 13 to 15 inches. So it's not very big, but you know, a typewriter is is run it's just a bunch of metal machinery bound together with tension so you know the force has to go somewhere and if the table is too flimsy it will shake the whole table and so and i'm not gonna okay i did bring it out to the kitchen counter and i was like typing on there but uh, i don't know it's not like the ideal you don't want to be like you know slicing an orange over your typewriter it's just not just not ideal so uh I waited and I waited. I just kind of experimented with stuff. And I finally found that uh, the best overall bang for the buck is the uplift desk Uh, for convenience, for durability, for weight. You need something nice and sturdy. It doesn't, it doesn't shake around. Uh, So yeah, would recommend it. What else is going on? Let me tell you, it's been a brutal couple of weeks. I am counting the days. Most of the time community practices relatively chill in comparison to other medical specialties but any pathology resident on this list serve knows what i'm talking about when i say uh 
the holidays are no joke in pathology because everybody's just trying to get their stuff down and and people are getting complicated diseases like weird stuff weird like third round immunostains type of weird uh, and first time diagnosis of malignancy and fluids like randomly. How'd you like it? You showed up on Christmas day and you have, to, Oh, I got a plural effusion. Let me just go get that drain right quick and I'll be back for dinner. Yeah. You go back for dinner. And then the next week between new years, you find out you got some weird metastatic, poorly differentiated cancer. Uh, and Oh, by the way, we don't know where it's coming from. Uh, so happy new year. Man, I tell you, if you're having a bad day, uh, you're, Somebody's got worse. Somebody's got it worse. What else? Uh, Bukowski, Charles Bukowski. um, Been getting into the works of Charles Bukowski lately, an L.A. icon. And uh, for every guy on this on this email list, it's look, am I am I wrong? The the pull of the hobo lifestyle is at the back of every man's mind. I, I have yet to, I have yet to meet a man who does not secretly want to just abandon everything in life and just drift off and, uh, be a hobo. I mean, if you're being honest with yourself, uh, no, anybody? No. Well, uh, you guys are all a bunch of liars. Uh, what else? Uh, other announcements. Uh, uh, the lady and the kiddo, they went out to visit some family and got the full Christmas experience. I will be joining them shortly. And in the meantime, I've just been cranking through a lot of work. So what are we going to talk about today? We're just going to go over some laboratory stuff. Why not? Why not? Let's talk about some laboratory stuff. All right. So what this, this article is called And the Band Neutrophil counts play on and there's a girl boss on the front i'm not gonna say her name because i'm not gonna that's just uh, look I'm, I'm not about doxing people on my podcast you know if you want to come on here and uh, and rock out with uh, chucky you're always welcome but uh, but i don't i poke fun but i don't people i don't put people down by name on this podcast. Uh, okay. So the title of counting bands, uh, the lead author, so-and-so says, we thought this had all been laid to rest 30 years ago. By the way, this is a industry publication in, uh, in my industry, the pathology and lab industry. Uh, it is an industry publication that (laughs) we used to, uh, that we used to use as scratch paper, uh, when we were in residency we used to make fun of it. Uh, and now here I am. Uh, this is my loose. <laughs> this is my only connection to uh, academic medicine. Is is reading this this uh, this magazine. So, okay. So they're talking about banded neutrophils. The the you, m- making the text count bands. So I I guess I never bothered to ask. I didn't realize this was a big time waster for lab technicians, but. Uh, they had enough evidence like 30 years ago to to not include manual band counts on uh on complete blood, blood counts. So for for all you anybody's listening that's not in medicine, so like a band is like an intermediate form of a, of a neutrophil, which is a it's a type of cell that goes out and attacks bad guys in your in your tissues, right? You have like an infection and then all the neutrophils they come out and then they uh, and they release their chemicals and then the macrophages come and chew it up. So, lab techs, they're they're behind the scenes in a lab, obviously, and they um, they're getting a little upset that they're being made to do all these uh, band counts. Eighty six percent of labs still <laughs> that participated in this survey still report bands. Uh, on the morphologic challenge bands classified as, so they basically do this comparison of, uh, of how lab techs are classifying bands. And, uh, for the ones that were easy, participants classified them well, 78 to 98.3% respondents agreed. And for moderate and difficult bands, it was poor three to 39% classified them as segmented neutrophils. Uh, so this is, this is the con, this is, these are the controversies we're facing here out on these streets 
in the trenches of laboratory medicine. So banned neutrophil counts are like Vimentin in surgical path. It's like half of us still do it. Dude, I'm going to raise my hand on this one. Okay. Look, I'm not ashamed. If I get a sarcoma that's negative for everything, damn it, I'm throwing Vimentin on it. And you can make fun of me passive aggressively on Twitter. Oh, wait, Path Twitter doesn't exist anymore. Because Elon Musk ate all of you. No, I'm just kidding. I love you guys. Uh, I know some of you are probably on Pathology Twitter. You know, your Cheeto fingers banging away on the keyboard. What is Chucky talking about? But yeah, it's like it's like Vimentin, you know? It, it, it doesn't really have any utility, but it's like we used to say, you, you're not ordering Vimentin because you want it. You're ordering it because uh, because LPD wants it. Uh, a renowned soft tissue pathologist. Actually, that's not even a good argument anymore because even at the Brigham, they don't they don't want you to order Vimentin. I, I'm pretty sure they've like published numer- numerous papers about how it's completely useless. So, all right, what else is going on? What else is going? Okay, in fee schedule, final rule: lower cuts than proposed. CMS finalizes HB hemoglobin A1C coverage. Okay, whatever. In the 2004 Medicare Physician schedule, uh, Fee Schedule Final Rule, CMS reacted favorably to uh, pathologist advocacy and overall payments to pathologists are expected to decrease by an estimated 2.7%. Well, that sounds okay. Well, that sounds reasonable. Eh. Uh, we'll, just, we'll just rob them of 2, 2.7%. They're not even going to notice. <laughs> They're too busy ordering Vimentin. Pathologists were projected at the beginning of 2023 to receive a Medicare cut of 6.5% starting in 2024. Okay, so it was going to be 6.5%. And then, okay. and then it's driven largely by the G2211, a new evaluation management add-on service developed by the CMS and expected to be implemented in 2024. Due to budget neutrality. Okay, I've heard this. Okay, so bottom line is that th- this is how they pit doctors against one of each other, right? Like, so this is between, this is the difference between like the business world and, you know, the entrepreneurial world and medicine. So they make it a finite pot so that they're just pitting doctors against one, one another. So instead of all doctors, you know, having this positive sum mindset that the, that the pie is expanding. No, they, they ratchet down the overall pot of money in Medicare. And then you basically have to hire all these lobbyists to, to get your share of the pie and you got to pay the lobbyists too. And the hospital industry and the insurance companies are, are just laughing at all of us because ultimately they own the house. Uh, but I don't know. My prediction is that things are going to get so. I think things are going to get so bad that the cabal is going to crumble. They don't want us in. See, doctors are like uh, doctors are like the Rastaman man. We're like the Rastas in Jamaica, persecuted for just doing what we do. Like we're just out here fighting disease, man, making diagnoses, working late, you know, serving the comunidad for my Latin friends. La gente, la raza, we're out here just doing good work, and they don't like that. They don't like that. They just want to, they're like, we want to own everything. We want you. We want you employed. That's what they really want, dude. They want to own you. (coughs) Excuse me, but this is not an activist podcast. This is not now. I just want to read this quote from a pathologist that I re- really respect. Okay, uh, so yeah, that article about the pay cuts, it, there's nothing else interesting in it. It's just the same song and dance about, you know, oh yeah, we have to stick together and lobby, blah, blah, blah. There was like an email listserv going around, um, not uh, whatever. It was, it was for like the some pathologist organization, like uh, delegates. And some people on there were talking about doctors unionizing, and it's like, yeah, okay. Well, I, I actually think that unionizing makes us even weaker. I think that we all just got to like save a bunch of money and then just like not accept any contracts from people that are trying to screw us over. And then 
go leave and start our own country. That's what I think we do. That we all we all get together, leave and start our own country somewhere in the Pacific Islands. And anyone who wants medical care can follow us there and we'll take care of them on on a cash basis. Then anyone who can't afford it will just do your your stuff for free. Just like they did like, you know, in in the eighteen hundreds. And even in the nineteen hundreds up until the Nixon administration. Um that's what I think we should do. It could happen. Dare to believe. Dare to dream. All right. So this is so. This, okay. This is a couple articles down. Digital pathology and AI drivers, budgets, and jobs. Okay. So they go around here and they quote a bunch of people. Uh, and there's okay. There's so there's one lady that works uh, for major company and she talks about the bleeding edge and this there's a let me read this quote pathology is a job an occupation but it's made up of a bunch of smaller tasks ai is very good at the small tasks but terrible at jobs it doesn't have to be it doesn't have a way of putting it all together like the pathologist needs to do so if your job is to find acid fast bacteria you are going to be out of a job. If your job is to diagnose a lymph node with a constellation of features that are critical to a patient's treatment, you are not out of a job. I look forward to uh, AI making those repetitive tasks easier, uh, helping with the business management and the QA and the QC, find, uh, finding mitoses, etc. But I don't see uh, uh, a threat to the job itself. So I, I just think this is a super based uh, quotation uh and okay so i might as well so that's from uh dr eric glassy out in california and since i doxed him i'll just go ahead and dox uh so the the first quote from the neutrophil article was from dr vigara luri from usc keck school of medicine there you go um so I try to present any, dude, if I'm going to quote someone on this podcast, I try to present them in a good light. You know, I'm, I'm not going to be out here like trolling people that are in my professional community. Uh, at least I'll try not to uh, name names. All right. So let, let's skip the rest of that magazine and I'll just flip to the next one because there was something that came out in archives that really resonated with me. Because uh, I'm living this. It's just a really nice review of undifferentiated neoplasms. So for the, for the non-medical people uh, in the audience, okay, so what is an undifferentiated neoplasm? Uh, okay, so if you have a tumor growing in your body somewhere, uh, it's our job to classify it as uh, epithelial. So like it's coming from a surface layer. Of your like, so that could be from the skin or like from your esophagus or stomach or something like that. That that's like a carcinoma. That's the that's the word they use for it. And then there's also uh, uh, like uh, melanoma is kind of an in between tumor type. Then there's sarcomas, which are exceedingly rare. And so this article is basically a current. It says a current approach to undifferentiated neoplasms with focus on new developments and novel immunized chemical stains by Dr. William Borch and Dr. Sarah Monaco. So uh, let me just skip around here and show you some parts that grabbed me. So the int- so bottom line is that uh, we always get these neoplasms that are very difficult to classify. So undifferentiated r- neoplasm in this review will include tumors that are morphologically ambiv- ambiguous or poorly differentiated without a clear primary site or subtype based on initial cytologic review. And then they talk about approach. They have a nice big uh, decision tree algorithm uh, based on morphology and immunostains using terms like cohesive, discohesive, epithelioid, spindled, or mixed. And uh, one thing that grabbed me was this little section on GATA3. So... Okay, GATA3 is generally a useful marker of breast origin, but in the triple negative or metaplastic setting, the sensitivity of GATA3 can range from 54% to less than 20%. A new marker showing great preliminary success is 
trichorhinal phalangeal syndrome type 1, or TRPS1, try to say that five times fast, which has been shown to be positive in more than 85% of breast carcinomas, including metaplastic types, and shows a lack of expression in the majority of other tumors, including other GATA3 positive tumors, such as urothelial uh, positive carcinoma. So, look, you can like you might laugh at me and be like, oh, what, what's Chuck talking about? Oh, this is, a, this is a easy, this is an easy tumor. It's just like, yeah, dude, yeah. Wait till you get some fluid with some weird, large, malignant cells floating around, and the person has like a history of GATA three, and uh, and the tumor's negative for GATA three. It's negative for any like hormone receptors, and people are calling you asking for some sort of explanation, and you're asking you to pin down. A diagnosis when you don't really have the main tumor in your files. So, like, if you had a, if you had the slides to compare it to, then yeah, you could confidently, well, not confidently, but you could just say, you could at least say, okay, we don't know for sure where this is, this tumor is coming from, but we compared it to the immuno profile of the original cancer that was diagnosed here, and we looked at the cells and they look similar and the immuno immuno profile is the same uh because so some of these breast cancers can be sox 10 positive uh and uh if you if you knew that from the biopsy then you would at least have an explanation but yeah why, why am i telling you this i'm telling you this because there's a lot of ambiguity in the stuff that we diagnose it's not all cut and dry so when you're banging on the door asking wondering why you're report is taking so long well it's because there's other stuff going on behind the scenes my friend it's not personal okay well i like this next section too one area of traditional difficulty concerns the diagnosis of primary intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma versus metastatic carcinoma to the liver often the clinical and radiologic presentation could be compatible with either as both metastases and intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma can present with multiple discrete lesions Pathologists traditionally resorted to cytokeratin, CK7, CK19, and CK20. But unfortunately, both intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and many other metastatic carcinomas share a CK7 positive and CK20 negative immunophenotype. The result was a diagnosis of exclusion involving extensive additional imaging and clinical procedures by the clinical team to rule out another source. Furthermore, Poorly differentiated hepatic cellular carcinomas can also lose expression of HEPAR1, alpha fetoprotein, which limits the ability to make definitive diagnosis. Albumin RNA in situ hybridization is a new diagnostic modality to convert hepatic origin with high sensitivity and specificity. Okay, uh, so the high sensitivity of albumin RNA ish for hepatocellular carcinomas and intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas but have also noted the subset of lung, gallbladder. So there's always a caveat, a subset of lung, gallbladder, pancreatic, hepatoid, and acinar cell carcinomas and breast carcinomas can also show positivity. Gee, thanks a lot. Since I just started using RNA-ish on these intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas and issuing a comment saying that it can be positive at 60 to 70% of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. What am I supposed to do with this? Okay. Why can't you make it simpler? And that's the thing you can't. She can't. So hats off to the uh, scientists that are at the bench uh, putting out these studies. And uh, yeah, we're grateful for the knowledge, but it does make life uh, a little bit more difficult because you had you just have more stuff to keep up with. Nevertheless, as part of a wider panel, okay, I like this R- RNA. Ish. Albumin RNA-ish is a valuable tool to save patients additional procedures and delays in treatment for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. Furthermore, it can be helpful when patients have other CK7 positive adenocarcinomas such as lung to help exclude a metastasis that would be negative for albumin-ish and lead to a more accurate staging. An upper GI gastrointestinal primary may also be considered in the CK7 adenocarcinomas present in the liver and in these scenarios, homeobox protein, CDX2, homeobox and cadherin 17 have been shown to be helpful. Uh, there you go. 
So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of like, you know, fancy words in there, but bottom line, we're not making these diagnoses and alteration in isolation. We are compiling all of the clinical and radiologic information. All right, so they go on to talk a little bit more about small round blue cell tumors, uh, the, the SMARCA deficient tumors, starting to get a little bit more esoteric, but in the next few paragraphs down, he says, for spindle cell proliferations, the main differential diagnosis includes mesenchymal tumors, including sarcomas, spindle cell melanoma, sarcomatoid mesothelioma, and sarcomatoid carcinoma. Typically, cytokeratins are critical for con- confirming a carcinoma or mesothelioma. How- however, cytokeratin expression has been reported in melanomas 1 to 40% and malignant vascular tumors such as angiosarcoma, 31%, and epithelioid hemangioendotheliomas, 67%, which is why a panel of stains is always encouraged. For spindle cell proliferations that are cytokeratin positive, especially those within the abdominal or chest wall, the possibility of malignant sarcomatoid mesothelioma should also also always be considered before rendering a diagnosis of carcinoma. So why did I highlight this? I think I... So I think the shift from being in a training role to being out in the real world is that like you got to show up to these tumor boards and you need to be able to express some degrees of uncertainty. Do you, do you know what I mean? So it's like just saying that something is positive or negative is like a, a mid-level can do that. Like that's not what they're paying for you. So knowing that melanomas, you know, one to 40% of them can you know, have cytokeratin expression. That's somewhat helpful when you have to like, when somebody calls you and asks for like, you know, how likely do you think this is? Uh, and then you can give them like a number. Um, and I have had melanomas that go to the liver and they pick up keratin. And, you know, the, fortunately in those cases, I've had prior biopsy slides or a, a, like a, a lymph node with the same tumor that I can use as a reference point. So, um, that's the advantage I think of practicing at a larger center because you just have access to more material. Uh, okay. Next little section, new markers in the u- diagnosis of neoplasms with neuroendocrine, uh, neuro and what does that word mean? Neuroendocrine. Uh, I don't know. It, it, what neuro endo, it's just a class of tumors. Um, it's an, these are cells that occur in various tissues of the body and have certain immunophenotype and very different genetics than a standard carcinoma of that same site. Challenging subsets of these tumors occur not infrequently in the lung. Oh boy. In poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors with markedly elevated proliferation index, staining with TTF1 and traditional neuroendocrine markers such as synaptophysin can be variable. Recent RNA expression studies have showed at least four subtypes of small cell lung carcinomas defined by expression of uh, big word ASCL1 and neurogenic differentiation factor 1. Okay, so these are basically just new markers. So, okay, let's say you're a patient and you get a report that says uh, high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma, like you just show up with a liver mass, and uh, and that's what the pathology report says. So this section of the article, I'm not going to read you every word, but bottom line, we we have like three, two main markers, the synaptophysin and chromogranin. Those should be positive in the cytoplasm of these tumor cells. The problem is that they don't have very much cytoplasm, so some, sometimes you won't see it. Uh, so then, okay, what do you use, CD56? No, that's not really helpful. That's positive in, like, everything. So generally, if we're having problems with those first two markers, we'll send it out for INSM1, which is another marker, but it's nuclear, so it's a little bit easier to read. And it's much, and it's more specific. Synaptophysin is very sensitive, uh, but INSM1 has better specificity for neuroendocrine, neuroendocrine carcinoma, and that's something that might delay your report for uh, a day or two. 
Uh, okay, so what did I write down here? Funny lady from MSK. At a, oh, yeah, at a, so just, oh, yeah, this is just funny. <laughs> I went to this meeting this one time, and there was, uh, it was like the topic was long cytopath, and I just remember one path. Some some lady walked in like 10 minutes late. <laughs> and, the, and then like the, you know, like the academic. So at these meetings, it's basically like one, you know, you know, widely, highly published academic is driving the microscope. And then there's a bunch of just at whatever average Joe's like me, pathologists like si sitting around the table. And uh, I don't know, that, that that was just like the first, I mean, I guess if, if it's your time and like you're there, to, I mean, the lady seemed a little bit annoyed, you know, expectedly, but uh, it, was just, it was a funny interaction because it's because... <laughs> It's like, what do you, what do you do? Like slap a grown lady on the wrist for being late? <laughs> um, all right. Well, it's funny to me. It's funny to me. Uh, I actually think that she did. She probably, I, I wish she would have just gone postal and, you know, just completely flown off the handle uh, and made it weird for everyone in the room. That's what I would have liked to, to have seen. And that's what I paid for. You know, it was like a $2,000 course. Uh, the least you could do is, uh, the least you could do is throw a glass of water, lady. Otherwise, what am I paying for? I can read all the rest of this in the journals. Okay. I go there for the violence. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Uh, so these, these frustrating... To, okay, so, so the, basically the point they're making is that some of our classic neuroendocrine markers, there's a subset of small cell carcinoma or high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma that's that is negative for all of these. And it's also negative for INSM1, which is what we usually use a, as a backup. So now they're saying that there's a couple, there's ASCL1 and NEUROD1, which tends to be positive in these rare variants that are negative for the other ones. So I don't even know where I would send that. So fortunately, it's just a matter of time before this happens to me because there's a lot of smokers in Texas. So it, it's going to happen to me, I bet, in the next 6 to 12 months. I guarantee it's going to happen to me. And it's probably going to delay the report. Well, I'll just issue a prelim, and people are going to be blowing me up, asking me, like, oh, hey, is it small cell or is it not small cell? And I'm going to have to, like, you know, call them back with my hands in my pockets and be like, oh, well, it looks like small cell, but I don't know. And, and they're going to be like, well, do we start them on platinum-based chemotherapy or not? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I want my mommy. That's what I'm going to say. I'm literally, I'm literally going to say that. I'm going to be like, I want my mommy. Okay. All right. Enough shenanigans for today. Okay. So short episode for this week because uh, I'm exhausted and I still got a giant stack of cases on my desk. So that's all for today's episode of Three Deeper Cuts, the lifestyle magazine for the practicing surgical pathologist, bringing you high signal content fueled by 10% buffered neutral formalin, Hope you enjoyed listening. If you like this content, subscribe to the newsletter at 3dpercuts.substack.com. At the moment, 3 Deeper Cuts is hosted on Substack in the form of an audio newsletter, but we are also distributed on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, as well as YouTube, as long as I can find the time to upload them. Uh, one of these days, I'll get a virtual assistant. But anyways, I hope you enjoy the rest of your week, professors. Thank you for tuning in. I am your host, Chuck G., until next time, be well and stay curious.